Looks like I'm going to be talking about building a better hero. I'm going to remember to start my timer. Yes, for the first time, four presentations, I finally remember to start my timer. Hope it works. Anyway, but yes, thank you very much for coming on out. My name is Captain Mike. Uh, anybody here been to my other panels? All right. Uh, even if you haven't been to my other panels, I think this will still work out great. Uh, but it does mean that some of this may seem a little familiar. Uh, but building a better hero, what I really want to get into here is how to take the idea of not just making a character for a game, but actually making that character a, a full-fledged character, something, uh, someone with background, someone with hopes, dreams, goals, ambitions, uh, but someone who can also, you know, get killed by goblins. Because what's more heroic than that? A little bit about me, and like I said, if you've seen my other things, you've seen this before. In fact, you'll notice my stats never change. That's because I am unaging and immortal. Uh, the only thing that does change is the number of years that I've been role-playing. I'm now up to 30-something years of role-playing. 30. Uh, but I do have an MA in writing and BA in English, uh, which means that I do know a lot about character, and especially designing character and leading things up. One of the things I like about role-playing is that it's like writing, but you don't have to know what's going to happen, so you can still be surprised, which is fun. It's one of the things that I most like about role playing. Also, it's a lot faster than writing your own book. I'm sure many of you have already figured that out. Yeah. All right, so the stuff that I want to talk about today, uh, what are the parts that go into your protagonist? I'll be using the term hero here very loosely. When I say hero, I really mean protagonist, the person that you're playing. Certainly, your hero can be just as depraved and evil as you like or as the game can withstand, uh, but I'll just be using hero loosely. Uh, protagonist parts, start to finish, we'll talk about uh, how to start out, getting into working with others, which if you don't play with other people, may not be a thing, uh, but that will also include things like non-player characters, going on adventures, accomplishing goals, uh, things, uh, things I've seen go wrong, as indeed I'm sure we've all seen some character go incredibly wrong, uh, and what to do when the character's arc is done, and what is there happily ever after. But it just wouldn't be a Captain Mike presentation without this one. This one actually gets slightly modified, which is to remember that players are people and people are different, but a good rule for every player is always know your audience. Know not only your GM, but also the people that you're playing with, because you're all part of the same audience. By the way, as I go along, if you have any questions or comments or concerns, feel free to shout them out or raise your hand, depending on how, I don't know, orderly you feel. So. Let's talk about designing a hero. There are traditionally two different ways to go about designing your hero, and depending on what game you're playing, you may have an option to choose between the two, uh, or you might not have the option to choose between the two. Some games require you to do one or the other. So you could roll randomly, which is so classic, right? Dungeons and Dragons, these six little stats, that's everything that makes a character. Strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, charisma, 3d6, down the line, whatever you roll, that's what you get. That's pretty old school. Uh, even Dungeons and Dragons itself doesn't even hold to that. It usually does, you know, 46 and remove the last one or, you know, whatever. There's so many permutations. But the underlying premise is still the same. Uh, the game mechanics may require it. It is unpredictable. You could end up with a character that is like, ooh, straight 18s, how perfect. Ooh, straight fives. That's going to be a tough sell. In fact, if I remember correctly, a five in every step won't even qualify you as an adventurer in D&D. Uh, but that's good and bad. Now it is bad because you may end up like, oh, I really wanted to play, you know, a wizard, but then I ended up with a uh, really low intelligence, you know, or whatever. Uh, but that can be good. Sometimes it gets you out of your rut. Sometimes I'll roll a character randomly just because I'm like, well, I don't know what I feel like playing. I don't know what I want to do. Or I feel like I've played a lot of, you know, fighty, smashy types lately, and I want to see what I get. Uh, so it can bounce you out of your rut. Uh, one thing that I found kind of interesting, just as a brief anecdote, uh, a friend of mine, I was playing a game with a friend of mine, and he was like, ah, you know, I kind of want to play like a fighter, I'm thinking like a paladin, you know, let's see if I do that, but he, he really wanted to do the hardcore six stats, three dice each, just go down the line, so he's like, I'm just going to do that, whatever I get, I get, and he rolled, and they were, they were great, uh, I think his highest stat was uh, an 11, and that was a significantly higher stat than the others. Just, you know, didn't win big at the table. 
And I was like, you know, hey, it's cool, man. You know, whatever you want to do. You want to move some of those numbers around. You want to like be, you know, re-roll a few of them because you got kind of bad luck. None of them were critically low, but just very, very low. And he was like, nope, I'm going to do it. And he did. He didn't qualify for a paladin, but he did qualify for a fighter because those requirements are very low. Uh, and so he played, but he played the character as a fighter who always wanted to be a paladin and wasn't good enough. Just wasn't strong enough, wasn't fast enough, no, certainly wasn't charismatic enough. But it lent a really strong quality to the character that I found incredibly endearing. He deliberately went to find out what he could do to be like a paladin. So even as a regular fighter, he still worked for the, the temple and he still went on holy missions and he still uh, you know, escorted priests and all of this stuff. Anything he could do uh, to make himself reach that goal. And he hadn't set out when he made the character. He just rolled you know, those six little stats. That's all that mattered. But by sticking to that random thing, it gave him like this whole arc. It was beautiful. And he was actually inducted into a, a holy order, just not as a paladin. Uh, the other, uh, now, he was one person alone. Uh, power disparity can be a problem. You know, you have one person who rolls all middling stats, and you have one person who rolls, like, amazing, awesome stats. Some games, the mechanics lean on those stats as being just such a huge advantage. Anyone who's played Dungeons and Dragons, you've got the fighter who rolls out with, like, incredibly high strength, bonuses aplenty. They just walk through combat, you know, compared to your other more middling characters. And that can be problematic. Or not. Sometimes it's okay, you know. Certainly if all of the characters are different types of characters, then it doesn't matter. They can have their powers in their own respective places. Uh, sometimes it's nice to have a character that everyone can kind of rely on to kind of get them through the combat section, so that way all of the other characters can get somewhere else. But it can be a problem. Um, I, uh, way back, way back, uh, I had a friend who, uh, for a long time, I thought he was straight up cheating. Like, he would walk in with characters that was just like 18, 17, 16, like nothing below a 14, stats of plenty. I was like, where are you getting these super characters? He's like, I roll them randomly. I'm like, is anyone around you when you roll these randomly? Do you have any video evidence of you rolling randomly? And then he made a character in front of me, and I'm like, you go to Vegas. <laughs> like, you just had the, the, the lucky touch. Not so much in combat. He was really good with D6s. D20 is, uh, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shadowrun, Shadowrun or Champions, both D6-based uh, systems. Uh, actually, come to think of it, he did play Champs. Wow, he was really good at that. Man, that's freaky. He had, he had the D6 touch, the D20 touch. Yeah. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I saw him make a character in front of me, and sure enough, it's like 18, 17, 16. I'm like, this, is, this character is worse than the ones that you brought in. I should have just trusted you, um, which is, you know, not a big deal, but it does, it does give you that power disparity and it can be uh, tough to balance because you know, it's, it's tough when you're trying to play a heroic character and then the person next to you is just better at everything. Uh, but it can also provide more challenge. You roll those middling stats sometimes, you know, or you don't get the, quest that, or the class that you, you wanted to qualify for. That can give you some goals. That can give you some stuff to work around. Uh, you know, you have a character with like a five intelligence, and now it's like, okay, well, one, I'm not, I guess I'm not playing a spellcaster, but, well, I guess you could use wisdom. Uh, but, you know, then it's like, oh, you know what? And before I, as a player, implement any good ideas, maybe I'll roll my intelligence because my character just doesn't get it. Uh, or a five wisdom. Like, you know, you get that perception low, you get that common sense rolls, you know, down. Characters can become very challenging. Plus, you know, random. It's fun. You never know what you're going to get. Dice go clack clack, serotonin goes brr. You know, who knows what you're gonna get? And you roll up a character and it's terrible, and you know, maybe you'd roll up another one or don't. Just be like, yes, we're gonna take this character and see what happens. Or you can do it constructive. Maybe you're like, eh, like, you know, random, eh, not so much. I need everybody to be, to be balanced, or maybe the game mechanics don't allow for random rolling. In which case, that's great. You can make exactly what you want. If you're like, ah, I want to make a superhero and they're going to fly around and shoot laser beams out of their cheeks and you know, their, their feet are going to turn into ninja stars. Boom, you can make that, presumably. Uh, somewhat surreal sort of example. Uh, so you can make what you want, which is really great if you know what you want. If you don't know what you want, it is actually kind of infuriating. Um, Speaking of superheroes, my old Champions book, uh, Champions uh, Hero System, that's what it was. Um, 
you know, superhero role playing game does not does not go in for random mechanics uh, for character creation at all. It's all point based. It's all very specific. Uh, and in my old champions book, there's a bunch of hand drawn, uh, hand written uh, random tables. I took a look at all the different powers and made like random tables just to, you know, for those times where I wasn't quite sure what I wanted, I could roll randomly. They're all ridiculous. They're all like 4d20 plus 6d10 minus 7 to try to accommodate their not round numbers. Uh, but yeah, so you can make what you want. If you don't know what you want, that can be kind of tough. Uh, constructed characters are, generally speaking, logical. Because you have a set number of points, you can allocate those points in particular places. Everything fits to a certain logical level, where you can be like, OK, so starting characters will always have, their stats may be different, but they'll always have X amount of whatever. You know, Vampire is a great example of that, the White Wolf system. You know, you get a certain number of dots, you get a few freebie points to kind of, you know, switch it up a little bit. But ultimately, you know that you're not going to have a starting player that is just like, a, you know, super monster right out of the uh, right out of the gate. With constructed characters, you will always have uh, player characters that are always on par. And if they're not on par with each other, you know exactly how not on par with each other they are. Uh, any point-based character system, you know, especially if you keep track of the experience points carefully, you can see exactly, oh, this character is at this level, this character is at this level. You can see the difference. Accommodate as necessary if you want to, uh, which can be very handy. Uh, in some ways, a constructed system can be more fitting because you don't have to worry about the, the very bizarre random outliers. Um, I suppose as an example that may, may or may not shine terribly well on me. Um, I rolled a, a, a friend of mine was making a campaign and was like, hey, you know, we're, we're going to play this Saturday. I'm not going to see it before then. Uh, so go ahead and just roll up a character and, you know, and whatever, and, and we'll, we'll integrate you. So I was like, okay, cool. So I rolled up a character and I'm like, wow, high strength, high constitution, low a lot of other stuff. Thinking fighter. And it was, it was the heady days of the late 90s. The, uh, you know, D&D was in its second edition and the Psionics Handbook had come out recently. And uh, if anybody remembers the Cyanix Handbook, it does not play well with others. It still doesn't. Uh, but I was like, ooh, you know what? Even if you're not a Cyanix, because I know that would totally mess up his entire thing, there is that rule for wild talents, that chance for people to have just like one or two psychic powers. And it's like a really, really rare chance. But I'm going to give it a roll. Boom, got it. I was like, OK. So I ended up with a. Uh, a hobgoblin fighter with ridiculously high strength with a psychic talent to heal himself completely uh, and overnight. Like he could go into a psychic trance and heal himself overnight. Wildly unbalanced. Do not recommend it. My friend is a saint or fool for even letting me get away with that. Uh, but sure enough, I walked in. And uh, yeah, I just walked through every combat scenario just like a, like a bloody whirlwind. Uh, but he made it fit. Uh, credit, to, credit where credit is due. He made that fit. My character became like the, the kind of like all-purpose crusher. It was just like the, you know, oh, you know, this person's giving us trouble. Well, OK, just send, send Darrow after him. And uh, you know, he'll solve problems the way he solves problems with uh, axes and faces. Uh, but that also meant that my character was way out of line with everyone else. I had to play that character as someone who had to be directed by the others who actually worked more as a party, which we made work. We actually, it was actually pretty interesting. The premise of the game was that it was a, a sort of like a criminal mafia in the fantasy universe. So I was the enforcer. And I was not a part of any of the deliberations. I was not a part of any of the stuff. I was the guy who was like, go break his legs. And I was like, just his legs? Oh, it's like you were there. Um, but it also meant that, that the GM had to like build things to fight me, uh, which was fun. And it was, it was really great and speaks very well as him, him as a GM. But there is always that chance uh, that when you're not constructing the characters following like the, the set guidelines or the set points, you may end up with that character that is just like way out on the other side of the bell curve, which can work. Any character can work under the right conditions. Oh, and constructed characters are fun. You get to make exactly what you want. And you get to tinker with the little parts and be like, well, if I move this a little bit, if I take this away, I can move this up. All right. The origin story. What is a hero without an origin story? What is Batman without dead parents? What is Spider-Man without dead parent figures? 
the origin story. So your, your backstory, you can have an individual backstory to your character. You can be like, all right, my character comes from the city of Hadrubra and went to the college of Hadrubra and then found a cursed book and gained magic powers. Cool, awesome. But you can also integrate your backstory. If you have a number of players and they're all building characters at the same time or even deliberately bu uh, building characters together, you can integrate your backstory and that also gives a good reason for the party to already be connected in some way. Uh, you can also have just a fairly simple backstory and then use the beginning of gaming to create more of, well, I guess it's not technically your backstory, it is your regular story, but you can have a light backstory. Sometimes, sometimes people's histories aren't complicated. I grew up in a town and then I moved to a different town. That's, how, many, how many of us have that backstory? <laughs> Uh, now you can get into a lot of detail in it, like, oh, I did this, and I went here, and I did this for this reason. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, along with backstory, consider goals and purpose. What is, not only, not just where is your character coming from, but where are they going to? What is it they want to have? What is it they want to achieve? These goals can be very reasonable and simple, uh, or unreasonable and incredibly complex. They could be completely nonsense. You know, I want to, my goal is to become a demigod. Oh, that's a pretty lofty goal. I don't know if you're going to achieve it this week. Uh, but, you know, I mean, there's a few more multi-level marketing systems that promise that. Uh, but yeah, and so by having that goal, then the character has a reason to go after things. And from a GM side, that's great, because whenever, players, or whenever characters have goals, then when you have an adventure, you just tie it into that goal. You want to become a demigod? Well, you hear about this artifact, and now you have to go through this dungeon I made. But that goal and that purpose, it can be very helpful to kind of fill in the gaps when you're like, well, I don't know what to do. You know, where is my character going? Character's directionless. At the same time, though, the goals, they don't need to be overriding, and they probably shouldn't be, because then it becomes harder for your character to integrate into whatever the adventure is. And realistically, you know, most of us have goals, but that doesn't define our every waking moment. Uh, I have a goal to become a famous presenter, but that doesn't mean I wake up every day, like, shouting on a street corner anymore. I do other stuff too. Make coffee while shouting about role-playing mechanics. Uh, it's ridiculous. Uh, along with the goals and the purpose, consider the character arc pro uh, uh, sorry, oh, forgot how to speak for a moment. Consider the character arc projection. Now, projection is kind of the key word in that. Now you might have a character, and sometimes characters are pretty straightforward, like, hey, I, you know, I'm a, I live in a fantasy world, and I want money, so I'm going to do things that get me money. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, but a character arc projection, this is where you're considering, okay, so my character is going to start off doing this sort of stuff, but then I think later on there might be a, sort of a twist where, you know, falling to the dark side, you know, later on. Like, I'm going to start off as a Jedi apprentice, but my ultimate goal for the character, not the character's goal, the player's goal, is that they're going to end up being seduced by the dark side and have to, like, you know, come down to that moment where they're like, which side do I choose? Uh, I say projection because you never know how things are going to go. I mean, you could have very lofty ambitions for this character, and then maybe that first boss takes a particular shine to you and choppy chop, and that's the end of the character. Very not narratively fulfilling, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, having those ideas, what do I think is going to happen to this character? Um, as a strange comparison, uh, whenever I play, uh, anybody here ever heard of an uh, uh, obscure game called Skyrim? Yeah. Um, whenever I play Skyrim, I always think of my character arc projection. I'm already, because I've played through it, look, it's not important how many times I've played through Skyrim. <laughs> Uh, but I'm also like, you know, I can't do all of the quests in every character because not every character should do all of the quests. Or not all of the quests have the same character type. So I'm like, okay, so I'm going to like start with this quest, I'm going to start with the Thieves Guild, and then I'm going to, you know, find, realize that I have magical uh, powers, so I'm going to like go through the Thieves Guild quest, and then I'm going to do the Mage Guild quest, and then find out that I'm the Dragonborn, you know, something like that. Uh, so I actually plot my own character projection to decide which types of quests I do. And you know, as I go through, if I end up getting sidetracked, <laughs> big surprise, uh, you know, that becomes part of the story too. But there's always that idea that I'm gonna try, you know, try for that kind of a thing. Uh, that's also something really handy to share with your GM, because if you don't share it with your GM, it's hard for them to integrate it into the story, which would be handy. 
And you know, finally, as simple is reasonable. Not every character is super complicated. Not every character's backstory needs to be convoluted and full of twists and turns. Not, and not, every, uh, not every character has to have dead parents. Like, such a cliche, especially in the superhero world. Um, you know, so it can be simple. Like, yeah, I came from a small village, so I decided to make money and send it back to my parents. It's fair enough. All right. Interacting with others. This, I think, is where characters really begin to be themselves. Because you can have all the backstory in the world, you can say your character is whatever you want to say, but if they don't act that way, then are they really that character? So interacting with others, this is where your character really becomes the character. You can consider working as an organized party. Maybe your group has some sort of uh, regimented uh, concept. You know, you're very much like the team. Now maybe you're the A team or the B team, depending on how good you are. Uh, or you can be a group of individuals. Sometimes hero groups, they're just people who ended up in a situation. They just all got thrown in and now they got to make it work. These things happen. Uh, considering character animosity. Sometimes this happens naturally because the characters just kind of have different approaches to things. Uh, ideally it happens because the characters are arguing and not because the players are arguing and they just happen to have these little puppets that they can smack against each other. Uh, but yeah, character animosity can be very defining for, uh, for a character. Actually, uh, an example of this, a friend of mine was running a, uh, a Marvel Universe game and the premise was, I forget what the exact title of the game system was called, but it was like the Marvel something something. Uh, but his premise was that it was like the multiverse was starting to collapse and so all of us were different versions of our normally understood heroes. Uh, so like I played a character, I was uh, Gwen Stacy, but I was Gwen Stacy with the Venom symbiote. Because in that universe, Gwen ended up with the Venom symbiote, not Peter Parker. Or uh, actually, not um, Brock. Uh, but I was basically playing, and to all intents and purposes, I was playing Spider-Man. But just Gwen Stacy's personality, with a Venom suit that just had, you know, a slightly more chill vibe than the uh, Lethal Protector. Uh, one of the other characters was playing uh, Norman Osborn as the Green Goblin in a world where Norman Osborn became the hero. And Peter Parker was a mad scientist villain a la Doc Ock. So that's a natural sense of animosity there because I have a classic Spider-Man villain, a classic Spider-Man hero, and we bounced off of each other constantly. And it was great because it helped define both of us, both to establish that that Norman Osborn wasn't actually a bad guy because in his universe, he was the hero, uh, but also established that my own character was more complicated than just being the hero because she was out to get him constantly and frequently afraid of him. Uh, so there was a lot of opportunity for us to bounce back and forth. Now, when you have character animosity, of course, it helps to make sure that things are clear. It's like, hey, I'm not really angry with you but my character is furious. Uh, it doesn't help as much to come down to actual combat, uh, but that's sort of like bouncing off of each other. You know, how many movies have we, have, have we seen where all of the protagonists are always friendly with each other? Yeah, not a lot. I was about to say maybe some Disney movies, but actually that has some of the most intense in fighting. Uh, friendships, family, and rivalries. Like I said, how you work with other people, it helps define who you are as a character. So, even among player characters, but also among the non-player characters. How does your character deal with family? Does your character have family? It is a bit of a narrative cop-out to be like, well, you know, I have no family. But even if you don't have any family, well, like, do you not have them? Like, were they all wiped out? You know, I had a character who became a paladin because his village was annihilated by the undead, and he was the only survivor. So he didn't have to worry a lot about Mother's Day and Father's Day. Um, I mean, it got sad. Uh, but then at the same time, I have another character who her whole thing is that her village threw her out because she was too chipper. She was too perky. And coming from an orc tribe of very serious warriors, she was very annoying. So they basically told her to get lost. And so she's constantly trying to prove that she's good enough. Uh, and she, and I still, she's still set to go back to that village. She still has to go back and like keep trying to be like, hey, am I, you know, am I a strong enough warrior to make it back in? Uh, so those kinds of things. But the rivalries also, who you choose to have rivalries with and how those rivalries play out, that says a lot about a person's character. 
it's easy to be like, oh, well, you know, there's an evil dragon, I'm a hero, sword, dragon, pokey poke, it's pretty straightforward. But if your complaint with a dragon isn't that they are uh, just an evil dragon, but if your complaint is that is only that they're, uh, that the dragon is threatening a village, well, that says a lot. If your complaint with the dragon is that the dragon has a lot of gold and you'd rather have the gold, well, that's actually a very different character. Uh, if your complaint with the dragon is that it is a giant ball of experience points and you want those experience points, I might say more about you as a player. So dealing with NPCs, dealing with villains, when you have the chance for that you know, dramatic hero-villain dialogue, you know, how do you play it? What, it, what take do you, do you take on that? Do you take the bond role where you're just kind of you know, stoic and silent because you've got to take down the other person and just let them monologue? Are you trying to like, convince them to give up their evil ways? Do you try to befriend them? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I was just thinking uh, Steven Universe is kind of notorious for being a setup where the hero meets the villain and then makes friends with the villain and then they stop being a villain. But that's hardly the only case where that happens. Uh, Sailor Moon. Anybody remember Sailor Moon? How can it? Oh, you, we, were, we weren't going to forget Sailor Moon, Mike. It's only been one of the most popular anime for, or most well known anime for like 30 years. Maybe 40 years. Uh, yeah, Sailor Moon. Sure, there are villains that just refuse to give up what they are and they refuse to stop doing the evil stuff, but there are plenty that don't. There are lots of occasions where Sailor Moon, or in some cases Serena, uh, or Usagi, if you prefer that version, uh, convinces the person, like, this isn't good for you. This isn't, like, even within your, your evil paradigm, like, this person's being a jerk. Why are you helping them? How your character approaches these, that says a lot about your character. Uh, and of course, character ethics. Uh, you know, what is your considered? What is, what is your consider? What does your character consider good? What does your character consider bad? Uh, is it is you know money good? Getting stabbed bad? That's pretty common. Uh, but is your character willing to put other people ahead of gold, or does the gold kind of come first? It says a lot about your character, and it also says a lot about how your character should be reacting to things. All right, enough of all this talk. Adventure awaits. The adventures themselves will define your character. Otherwise, all you've really done is come up with an incredibly detailed preparatory set of notes. Uh, maybe a session zero or two. So adventure awaits. You can have back -driven, uh, backstory driven uh, adventures. If your character design allows for something, your GM may just pull directly from that for adventure hooks, uh, or even just whole adventures for that matter. Uh, so you can have backstory-driven adventures, especially if you're working with your GM, and especially if the entire party can kind of get in on it. Uh, sometimes you may have a party where you kind of take it in turns, like everybody gets their own episode. You know, you, it's like, oh yeah, in this episode we find out about, you know, Zachar's background, in this episode we find out about Elphington's background. Oh, that can be fun. You know, each person kind of gets their own particular time. Uh, and then, of course, distractions, side quests. I mean, what's role-playing without side quests? So even if you do have some sort of backstory driven thing where it's like, oh yeah, you know, I've got a, you know, my, my backstory is, uh, you know, I was found as an orphan and, uh, and on the doorsteps of the temple of Haja Baja Baja. And, uh, and then I became a priest of Haja Baja Baja. And uh, now I want to find who my real parents are. So I'm on this lifelong quest. Uh, but first I've got to help out this vendor because he needs six sandwiches uh, off of the cargo ship. But the cargo ship won't unload because the cargo ship needs seven oil barrels, so I have to talk to side quests. You know. And those distractions are fine. Your overall character arcs, that should be the defining stuff for your character. But like I said, it doesn't have to define day to day. You can still get distracted by all of these adventures, and the ones that you get distracted by and how you get distracted by them can still be part of your character. Because that says like, oh, if you're playing a good character, that makes sense. I want to do this thing but I see someone in need, so I will stop to help them. Or it might say something about your character to be like, I want to do this thing, but this bounty is really high. And it's on the way, right? As you go through the adventures, your character will develop personality. So even though you may have like a starter idea for what you want your character to be like, as you play the character, they will develop their own personality. And the more interactions you have, the more that personality gets defined and crystallized. In fact, sometimes it's kind of hard to gauge what the personality is going to be until you've had a couple of sessions. You've bounced off a few people. Uh, so you may start off with like, oh, I'm going to have like a really gruff dwarf. 
uh, you know, doing the classic Gimli thing. But then a few sessions later, you realize that you've kind of become like this sort of, uh, you know, the straight man to everybody else's comedian, but, you know, with a heart of gold. And that becomes more of a personality. It's like, okay, yeah, you're, you know, I, I got I to gotta be the rock that these other people can, can kind of tether themselves to, these bunch of flighty types, these uh, elves running around. And then there's the question of static or dynamic. Now, these are classic literary terms. A uh, static character is one that is unchanging. A dynamic character is one that is changing. And, uh, you know, of course there are times where characters remain the same, times where characters change a little bit. But static or dynamic, do they ultimately change? Does, does their perspective uh, actually change? Does their personality actually change? Does their character actually change? Sometimes it's interesting to play a static character. It's certainly easier to play a static character because then you always know what you're doing. But it, it's not bad. Someone who is you know, how they are at the beginning, and then they encounter life-threatening situations, uh, you know, crazy situations, traumatic situations, and still manage to come out of the other end the same person, that's fascinating. Most people can't manage that. Uh, and many characters uh, don't. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with a static character, but it says a lot. It basically sets up the idea of a character that is very resilient or very stubborn, and so these traits come through. But a dynamic character then, this can also be very interesting, uh, because then it's the question of like, well, how does the character change based on the traumatic events? How does the character change based on these, in many cases, life-threatening events? Uh, and then they come out as a different person. And then you can kind of like look back and be like, oh, wow, at the beginning I was like this, and at the end I was like this. And of course, ultimately, you gotta roll with it. You know, with a role-playing game, you're not just writing a story where you can control all the variables. And in fact, even in a role-playing game, we can't control all the variables because we keep putting them in, and the, rice go, the dice go clack, clack. So you got to roll with it. Sometimes you have a character where it's like, yes, I'm going to be this very you know, handsome, charismatic, noble figure. And the dice are like, no. No, you are not. You're going to blow every single charisma roll you make. I uh, actually, in the, I briefly mentioned earlier that I had a paladin character. He had a sidekick that would not agree that he was a sidekick, uh, played by another character, uh, by another player. Um, I don't remember his name, but he was a you know, fairly straightforward sort of a character, a tough fighter type, also into destroying the undead, so they palled around. Uh, but his premise was that he was supposed to be a nobleman, and from where I get my example, where he was like, oh yeah, he's supposed to be a nobleman who you know, was kind of on the outs with his family because he was like the sixth kid or whatever, so he wasn't getting anything. And so he went out as a warrior and adventurer to defeat the undead, ended up teaming up with my paladin, blah, blah, blah. Where is this going? Well, he's supposed to be this nobleman who was, who was you know, etiquette, trained in public speaking. The charisma roles did not let that fly. Uh, and in fact, my favorite one is when he was supposed to, we had a group of townspeople, they were worried about a vampire nearby, and we were like, okay, we need these guys' help because there's just too many for just the two of us. So we need these guys to like, at least, keep the small fry off of us while we go stake the vampire, do the, do the heavy lifting. So my character was like, all right, Ranganor, you go ahead. You, you, know, you lead, lead the pack. I already did a charisma roll earlier today to get them here. So he stands up and critically fails his rousing speech. So we do the roll and players looking at it and the GM's looking at it and they're like, I don't know how this is gonna play. So yeah, he stands up and he's like, attention, Hicks. Your miserable town will soon be even more miserable unless you band together, and most of you will probably live. Like, that's his, that was his speech. Not great. But he just had to roll with it. And the character over time developed that sort of like, like he had the etiquette and he knew it was proper, but he just had stopped caring. Uh, he had gotten, he was so far removed from his nobility and from his shining castles and his gleaming libraries that whenever he was dealing with regular people, or in fact most people, he just, he couldn't relate to them and he didn't bother to. So he was just like, ah, oh, whatever, you don't, you know, out of my way, peasant, you know, that sort of thing. It's a good thing we spent a lot of our time in swamps. <laughs> so yeah, so sometimes you just have to roll with it. And I don't think, you know, my friend intended for the character to be like that, but the dice sure did. Goals. You should remember your goals. 
Uh, when you design your character, I suggest making a note of what goals you're intending from the very beginning. Uh, that way you can remember them, because it's always kind of strange when you have someone whose like, intro is like, ah yes, they are on this eternal quest to find out who their parents are, or what their lineage is, or are they really the son of Poseidon, or something like that. But then like, they never do anything involving any of those things. Now, it's one thing to get distracted, but it's another thing to just never follow up on that. So remember your goals. That's also good life advice, right? Remember your goals. But also remember that your goals can change. Maybe your character, you know, they always wanted to find out, you know, who their parents were, but then, like, you know, they go on a few adventures, they fall in with a group of adventurers, they kind of adopt them as a family, and it stops being a goal because they realize they don't need to know. Okay, yeah, I was abandoned on the, you know, temple doorstep, but does it matter to me anymore? And that can be a really interesting character point, especially if you then reach the point with that character where it's like, oh, here's a hint at what your, your goal might be, and you're like, yeah, I don't need it anymore. You know, you, just, you abandon the goal. That's fine. You can abandon quests sometimes. And that gives you the opportunity to set new ones. And sometimes you achieve your goal. You know, if your character's goal is to get a whole bunch of money so that you can send it back to your parents, well, how many dragon hordes do you really need to, to steal from before a uh, family has enough money? So you can be like, oh, you know what? I've stolen enough. Maybe I don't need to steal anymore. Now I'll just do it because it's fun. Uh, but that gives you a chance to send new ones. Maybe even if you are a thief who's just like, your expertise is stealing, you know, dragon treasure. Uh, once you've set enough back for your family, you've got yourself a nice retirement fund, well invested, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, then you're like, okay, so what is my new goal? Well, I could keep stealing money, but I could send it to somewhere else. I could, you know, start, I could build a, I don't know, foundation or something. Uh, but it gives you a chance to achieve and set new goals, which is always interesting. And do take time to reflect. Have those character moments, especially if you've got a GM who, who is looking for some role playing. That's where your character comes out. It's not just in the dice rolls, it's not just in the attacks. Uh, you know, have those reflections, have those conversations with the other characters. Um, you know, where you can reflect on the things that have happened, the things that you're trying to accomplish. It gives you a chance to have that kind of dialogue. You know? It doesn't always have to be expository, although it certainly can be. Ah, yes, I remember when I was left on the temple of Shamran Shama, and that's why I'm here today, killing rats in the basement of an inn. <laughs> that's where we left off. Yeah, step, step, step. Possible pitfalls. Some of these things you may have already seen people do, or done yourself. I'm guilty of a number of these. Mary Sue's. If you are not familiar with the phrase Mary Sue, a Mary Sue is a character that is a self-insert for the writer, typically, or in this case, player, where the two are essentially inextricable. Uh, so Mary Sue's, I don't like when players have characters that are Mary Sue's. Uh, I always try to make sure, you know, I always prefer that there is a definite distinction between the player and the character, because I generally want interesting yet terrible things to happen to the character, but not to the player. I like it when good things happen to the player. I like it when good things happen to the characters, too, but uh, I am less inclined to put my actual friends in a series of traps or uh, you know, give them a, a, a philosophical quandary where the wrong answer is death. Or am I? Hmm. Uh, but yeah, uh, sometimes you know, players come in and they're like, sometimes it's very direct. Like, I made myself as a character. I'm like, ugh. Well, maybe not for this game. This is especially common. Um, I ran into this a lot when I started playing vampire. People were like, oh, it's basically me, but if I got turned into a vampire, I'm like, there's only two ways this can go. Either you're going to get very upset based on what's going to happen to your character because they will be attacked or you know, whatever, or they won't meet your exacting standards, or you're basically asking me to participate in like, some sort of two-person slash pick, and I don't know which is worse. <laughs> I don't want to do either of those. Uh, so I do not recommend... Mary Sue's. Your character, uh, a player, in my opinion, a player should always refer to their character the same way that they might refer to a character that they're writing about or a character that they're reading in a book. That sort of distinct separation. There's always the prima donna. You know, one player who just wants to... <gasps> some of you may... Some of you may find that none of this is a personal attack, I promise. But certainly I've been the prima donna myself, you know, where it's like, oh, but I've got this great character and it's an amazing backstory and I'm gonna basically, it's like a Shakespearean play when it comes around to my turn. 
I'm like, okay, so do you, you know, you know what do you do, what do you do? And it's like, ah, oh, well, based on my history, I know that I used to be a gardener until that fateful day when a wizard came to town and then fought the demon Shmargarash. And then I knew then that I was going to have to learn magic and harness it for the safety of, do you attack the ogre? <laughs> Using one of my many magical powers, I, with what spell? Prima donnas. Very handy though, you know, of course you want to encourage the role playing and you want to provide the role playing and so forth, but you gotta, you gotta keep it moderated. And everybody else's character, they're also part of the show too. As a GM, I try to give everybody an equal amount of screen time as much as I can. Uh, but as a player, I also try to keep that in mind too. If I'm gonna interact with an NPC, yes, I definitely wanna get in those role playing points, but I wanna make sure that, you know, everybody else gets a part too. The murder hobo. That's such an odd phrase to have just caught on like such wildfire. <laughs> so murder hobo, in case you are not familiar with the term, is a character that exists pretty much without consequence, solves problems with violence. Um, you know, especially when you have uh, higher level characters, it may seem like they are untouchable to the common rank and file goobers that otherwise populate the land. Uh, murder hobos are very similar. Uh, uh, the concept is very similar like in a video game, when you can kill someone and get away with it, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, if anybody's played an Ultima game, I have never played an Ultima game that did not result in me just becoming a murder hobo because I'm very bad at Ultima games because I never know what's going on and I inevitably become frustrated. Um, now, from a GM side, you never really want a murder hobo, especially if it's just one and the other part, the rest of the party is trying to actually role play. Uh, but as a character, like, you don't want to become a murder hobo. Remember, you're living in a world that does have consequences, and even though you know, the consequence may just be nothing more than this imaginary person dies or whatever, uh, it does tend to break the system. Adventures fall apart. Uh, adventuring parties also fall apart. Uh, you're making things difficult for the DM. Now, you might say, well, Mike, what if, what if my what if my character is just a violent sociopath and that's just, you know, they kill people, that's what happens. And I'm like, is that the char character you want to be playing? Like, is that a good idea in this setting? Does it work with the others? Maybe it does, and if it does, okay, cool. If it works, it works. Uh, but do watch out for the murder hobo. Also, if your character is supposed to be like a very noble figure who does good, but then they're like stabbing innkeepers and uh, you know killing city guards. That's a bit of a mismatch. Doesn't quite work. Uh, I was actually running. Uh, I was running a game for a group of, of people uh, that I didn't know very well, which was my first mistake. Know your audience. Uh, and I got there, but you know it was one of those things where they were friends of a friend, and they were like, "Oh, they've got this gaming group. There's a whole bunch of people. You know, you should come." And you know, I told them that you. you GM and stuff, and they were like really excited, and I was like, okay, fine, cool, I'll go meet some new people and play a game, that's fun. And I got there, and uh, it was, they, there were a group of people, they had a long table, they had buckets of dice, so I was like, okay, so we're off to a good start. Uh, and I'm like going around the table, just like, okay, what's your character, what's your character? And this one guy had a character, and he was like, oh, you know, my character's a high elf wizard, sort of like, you know, a Gandalfy kind of a figure, but, you know, elfy. I was like, okay, cool. So I start off the thing and they you know, go to see the king and the king's gonna give them the quest because it's like, oh, I've got this problem and I want you to, or sorry, he was going to get attacked and then he was gonna send them after the assassins. Because they're high level adventurers and that's what you do. You offload all of your kingdom's problems onto wandering, wandering troops. Uh, yeah, so we go in and uh, so the king gets attacked, they defeat the assassin handily and, uh, and he's like, oh, thank you very much, brave adventurers. I see that you have a great deal of magic and, and uh, skill at your disposal. Please, you know, can you, can you protect me and my family? And the wise elven wizard comes up with hundreds of years of experience, long hours of training, and says, how much you got? What's it worth to you? And he's like, well, I'll happily, you know, certainly I can, I can give you, you know, some, some gold, you know, five, 500 gold. He's like, 500 gold? Forget it. That's like nothing. That's like chump change. I'm like, this doesn't sound like ancient elfness. I can't imagine Gandalf rolling up to like the Riders of Rohan and being like, looks like you got a big problem here. 
well, if you've got some cash, maybe I can make this work for you. Yeah, Isildur's heir, huh? Hmm, be a shame if uh, someone went to set fire to all your gear. <laughs> it just didn't match the character, and it, it, it threw me entirely. Like, I, I was in the middle, like, I'm trying to, like, do, like, this kingly speech thing, and he's like, and, like, what do you say? Like, you just saved him, and he's terrified for his life. And he's like, I guess I could, I mean, the tr 500 is, like, 60 times what anybody else around here sees. Like, I guess I can get you more? It just seemed really out of place. Copyright infringement. Okay, so we're playing this game, getting some superheroes together. All right, what's your character? All right, well, he's a Canadian. Nice, good. And, uh, and his superpowers are that uh, he regenerates. <laughs> you already know where I'm going with this, too. Uh, nobody makes Ameri no nobody makes superheroes like America. Nobody makes the other set of superheroes like Canada. Uh, yeah, so you know they're coming out. Um, I remember a, another time where a friend of a friend was like, "Hey, you got to come uh, hang out with these people and, and do some gaming." Uh, and we were going around doing characters, and uh, there was a poster of, and I don't remember the name of the superhero because it was the late '90s, and let's be honest, there were a lot of them, and they all looked the same. Way too many pouches bizarre weaponry, gritty, Urgh. but he just like pointed to a thing and he was like, I'm playing that, I'm playing that guy. And I was like, oh. one, I still don't know who it is because it's just some guy with a sword who looks like he just fell off of the back of a, uh, you know, a spawn comic. In fact, he may have for all I know, um, but it's also like, eh, so can you tell me anything about him? And it was just, he was like, no. All right. Uh, but copyright infringement, uh, you know, not that I think Disney's going to go kicking down your door if you happen to make, you know, a, a superhero that is, uh, you know, remarkably similar to some of the Marvel ones. Uh, but at the same time, it's not great. Now, at the same time, I think it's very handy to be able to say, well, you know, Thor, like the superhero, like that character, but, and you can make tweaks to it. And it's especially handy for new players. Uh, and I find especially, especially handy for superheroes because they're so prevalent now. Uh, but yeah, so you can use them as, as markers and you can use them as inspiration, but make them your own. That's my advice. And of course, the greatest inconsistency is, or the greatest pitfall is inconsistency. Wow. The greatest inconsistency is also pitfalls. Yeah, inconsistency. And this is a really tough one. This is one that I struggle with pretty frequently because not only do you have to like remember to always play your character as your character, but you have to do it with like a week between each thing. And so some days, like I show up to a gaming session, I'm like, yeah, all right, let's do this thing. I can't wait to role play. I'm gonna like have some cool conversations, got ideas. And some days I roll up and I'm like, man, I really just want to stab an ogre in the face. Like if I, I'm just, I want to start a fight. I just, you know, hard day at work. I just want to blow off some steam preferably by casting fireball in an enclosed space. Like, help me out here. Uh, but for your character, the difference between those two days can be, or those, you know, that week, I mean, that could be a minute. Uh, and, it, you know, the more time you have between gaming sessions, the more difficult it can be to kind of make sure that you're always on that page. And so <laughs> there's not, sometimes there's not a lot you can do. Like, you are a person you, just as, you know, far more than your character is, and so your own attitudes will affect how the characters go. Uh, but trying to have that consistency can really help. I'll sometimes take brief notes about like, oh, you know, what was I, what was I doing last time? It's like, okay, do this. Uh, but just, you know, getting into the habit of like, okay, you know, part of the advantage of role playing is that we can step out of ourselves and into someone else's shoes for a while. Sometimes those shoes are pointy and curled and let you cast spells. Or they're bucket boots and come with a cape. Uh, but that can be as helpful too. So sometimes if I've had a really rough week and I'm like, oh, I just want to get into some combat, well, I can also just be like, or I can just let that go by being this other person for a little while. And that person doesn't have to be as stressed out about all of the stuff that I had to deal with. Because that person doesn't have to talk to my boss and doesn't have to mark papers and stuff like that. As a remarkably specific example. <laughs> so inconsistency is a very common pitfall. 
So you're like, okay, so we made the character, we had a bunch of adventures, what do we do next? Well, sometimes you get a happily ever after. You can complete your character arc. Maybe you started off as the Jedi initiate and you went through your training and then you got through the part where your master is inevitably killed and then you got the revenge on the person that, was, that had killed them and you had your brush with the dark side and you came out one way or the other. It's a completed character arc. So what do you do? Well, you could just retire the character. Sometimes characters stop adventuring. Sometimes they go back to a life of routine and then you can start a new character and that's fun. Or they continue doing other stuff and they have other adventures. So by, uh, once you achieve goals, setting new goals can really help uh, keep you moving forward. Sometimes you meet a tragic end. I am never happy when someone is killed off by a random encounter because I have too much love for the narrative structure. But a tragic end can still be a good end. Sometimes that's the end that you have to have. Maybe you know, when you go you know, master killed, get revenge, in the process of getting revenge for, on the person who killed your master, you yourself turn to the dark side. That's kind of interesting. Do you then continue to play the character as someone who is a dark side, uh, or who is a Sith, or a dark side Jedi, Jedi, depending on which system you're playing and how you look at it? Uh, or do you play a new character and your old character is now the villain? That could be pretty cool. Uh, brief aside, uh, I was playing a, a superhero game and uh, the heroes had to get into the supervillain prison, which had been taken over from within. Uh, you know the deal. And deep within it, there was, you know, throughout the whole time the, during the game, there was a supervillain that had been defeated long ago, and he was just kind of part of the background. He was, his name was Lord Overkill. Remains one of my favorite titles. Uh, and he was like a, you know, sort of like a Doctor Doom Iron Man figure. And so he was always kind of referred to as like, you know, the, the big bad of the previous age, and that's why they have superheroes still, and they're still regulated, because like he had nearly destroyed the world. So they're going through this prison, and they find his armor, like it's been encased in, for study and so forth. And all of the characters are like, yeah, we're, we don't touch it. We're not going near that thing. That's not why we're here. We've got other stuff to do, and there's no way that that thing, opening this cannot possibly do anything good. I was like, you sure? They're like, yes. So they all left and went to go do the other thing, except one. One character played by a player who was a new player and had kind of gotten rolled up into the hero team sort of just by coincidence. She wasn't really a hero. She just had superpowers. And when the other heroes had showed up and she displayed superpowers, they assumed she was a hero. And she just kind of got swept along. Out of nowhere, this player is like, yeah, when everybody else leaves, I'm going to open the thing and put on the suit. I was like, OK, I get to use all these notes now. So yeah, she puts on the suit, and it's like connected to hundreds of satellites, hidden cloning facilities, all kinds of supervillain machinations. Uh, and everyone's like, what? wait, what? No, don't put on the suit. And she's like, yeah, I put on the suit. And you know, here I'm like, OK, here's your suit stats. Here's all the stuff that you have. And she's like, like ca literally cackling with power. Just, ah, ha, ha, ha. I was like, what did you do? And that was how the, the story arc ended was the, the new, like reborn Lord Overkill, uh, you know, erupted from this prison and then became set to become the villain of the next arc, uh, which was kind of interesting. And by a strange coincidence, that ended up being the last session that we actually had. And it was uh, because I had to move. Uh, yeah, but then how cool was that? She went from being like this character that kind of like got pulled along to becoming the main villain of the setting. It was an interesting arc, and everyone thought that was pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, sometimes you retire. Sometimes people just get too old for adventuring. Sometimes they're just like, you know what? I've killed enough dragons. I've uh, nearly died enough. Maybe I'm just going to chill out a little bit. I'm going to go back to the Shire. I'm going to talk to the barmaid and uh, get married. And then, of course, there's always the ride into the sunset. Maybe your character doesn't retire. Maybe your character continues to have adventures. But maybe you just want to move on to another character. You felt like you did all of the major arcs. And so, like Indiana Jones in the end of the movies, you know, you ride off into the sunset, and that character is known to go on to do other things. Maybe they'll have cameo parts in other adventures. But you're like, all right, I did enough with that character. Let's move on to something else. Let's see what else we can do. Speaking of riding off into the sunset, 
I would like to thank you very much. I have been Captain Mike, and uh, I am happy to take any questions and or applause. Thank you. I am, of course, uh, also reachable at Captain Mike, Captain Mike uh, Once I get back, you can actually start accessing my email again. Uh, but I do have a few minutes for questions, if anybody has any, or just cool stories, if you have them. Yes? Uh, a couple things I want to comment on. One, we were talking about random versus um, not random in terms of character generation. Mm -hmm. One thing that we've kind of discussed doing in our group, and uh, you might be doing one of, one of our games, which is new games, is since we have six players, they give a stat, everybody rolls a stat, and then that, what we roll, each roll becomes part of our array for the, the whole group. So you kind of have... They're like meeting in the middle. Yeah. So it's a random set, but you're and using... Use. But everyone still ends up with the same number of points yeah. overall. It's an interesting approach. Let me know how it works out. <laughs> nice. That's really cool, because then at, at the very least, whether they roll well, you know, well or poorly. We fermented day 5e, so that's why we did it, to make sure, you know, the 5e could be wildly unbalanced in somebody. But if we're all equally unbalanced in the exact same numbers. Right. You kind of come you kind of come back around to being balanced. Right. No, that's a really cool idea. Nice. Any other questions? Comments? Yeah. Man, I was either really good or really bad. <laughs> uh, oh, although that does remind me, uh, if you're using the guidebook app, feel free to rate me, uh, ideally, at the maximum number of stars, which I believe is five, uh, because it does help me come back and do more of this stuff. Uh, but any other questions? Anything? Yeah, sure. Um, so we're starting. Friday, uh, next Friday, uh, new campaign. Um, we all decided that the GM poked in front of us because we made this table. And we're like, okay. Uh, we roll these life events. And okay. We can use them in any particular order we want. And I had originally intended to make this this like gigantic walking, talking tiger fisherman from like kind of sort of like fantasy Indonesia. And he was going to be like this fisherman, he may be like a caveman with a garter, and like, lo and behold, um, after rolling my dice, before he even reaches fighter level, he's gone to like, like the Shadowfell, the, the, you know, the Fey Wild, where he was like a servant to a Fey, and I'm just sitting here like, how do I cope with this? You have this like, wildly like, different backstory. Yeah. Uh, how do you cope with a random backstory? That's tough. Um, most role-playing games, I find, don't provide random backstories, although some of the first edition modules did. Um, and that can be handy if you don't know what you want to play, because then it gives you a, a thing. But you had a, a particular idea. I guess you kind of have two different, well, maybe three different ideas. Uh, you could conceivably shelve the tiger fisherman and play a different character born of the backstory provided. Um, you could play... I mean, a GM seems particularly excited. It's kind of hard to say no to it. Like he's, yeah, I know. Like he's the one working, making the game, you know what I mean? Yeah. The last thing I rolled was like, uh, you basically, through some terrible magic like accident, from your own, you've been flung somewhere else in the world, and now you're not even home. There's a lot. Uh, <laughs> although that kind of... Yeah. I want to go home, but... But maybe that kind of works. Maybe, you know, you, had, you have a character where... Then, you know, sort of like my, my not quite a paladin example, uh, just being a simple fisherman is all he ever wanted. But then through constant chance and circumstance was just never allowed to just chill out. Um, you know, it's just like, one, it's one thing after another with you people. Uh, you know, and so it's just this constant series of unfortunate events. And maybe the character just has a streak that doesn't allow him to, like, not help somebody. So, like, he's always like, oh, I want to get home. It's almost uh, reminiscent of the old Dungeons and Dragons uh, cartoon. Like, oh, we gotta find the portal home. Oh, but we need to save the, you know, adorable animal of the week or whatever. Uh, and so you can play it like that. Um, so that is one of the options. Uh, and then I guess the third option is to just significantly change what you want to do with the, with the tiger fisherman. Um, but that seems like it could be a good, like the, the middle ground is, is kind of a good setup where you can be like, you know, oh, I, I grew up in a fishing village and, you know, just as I was, you know, reaching the point where I could myself, you know, become the fisherman that I always dreamed I would be, 
you know, I caught a fish that took me into a magical portal. <laughs> you know, or whatever. It's a magical world. You get all kinds of stuff. Yeah? All right, I got one. Um, so, which one of your favorite characters you created you didn't think would be really good? Like, awesome. Play around. Let's see, a character, uh, a character that I didn't think would be good, but then took off. I mean, I like to think all of my characters take off. <laughs> Uh, but I'm extremely full of myself. Um, I've also played a lot of characters. Oh, you know what? Um, I did. So I put together a superhero for a game uh, where my friend was like, "Oh, we've got like this online game that we've got going on. You should, you know, come and hang out, or whatever." And it was uh, running villains and vigilantes. Um, and I put this character together, uh, and I was a little annoyed. Like it was my second choice because I came up with this cool character idea, but then the GM was like, "You have to roll randomly for your powers," and I was like, "Oh." can't do the thing. Um, so it was like my second, my second thing. And it was mostly just a chance to kind of hang out with my friends. Um, but uh, her name was Gauntlet. And she had gauntlets. And she was a superhero who had like magical techno gauntlets. She was sort of like Iron Man light in that respect. Fly around, pew, 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 force fields. Um, and uh, you know, she was sort of a glass cannon. Uh, and I just kind of made the character, and I made her character, uh, her intelligence ended up being pretty low, which was nice because it meant that I didn't have to pay a lot of attention to the you know, details of what was going on. I could just take the broad strokes. Uh, but then it ended up being a super fun character. Uh, and the other, you know, especially because I was playing with uh, players and characters who were both very detail-oriented and very intelligent. Um, and so I got to play kind of like the, the, the ditzy blaster. Uh, to everyone else's like genius person. And it was also great for them because then anytime somebody needed to do some exposition, exposition or explaining, I would just be like, I don't understand this at all. And they're like, well, we have to do this, to do this, to do this. And then practically look at the camera and say like, got it? <laughs> do you understand Gauntlet? And everyone else at home. Uh, which is great because it gives you that kind of like over the top super, superhero dialogue that was uh, wonderful. Um, and then she herself also developed a very kind of fiery personality as she kind of like bounced off of these other characters. Uh, and I played that character for like 15 years. Wow. Damn. Because that's how long the campaign took. <laughs> it took so long. All right. I think I have time for uh, just one more question if anybody. It's, yes. Um, how do you handle, when you have a scary concept of like, like the system that you're intending to play in doesn't really give you a way to express something? Uh, um, that's a tough one. So like, uh, so if you're like, oh, I want to play like Wolverine, but it's a D and D game, and you can't just like have regeneration, you know, or whatever. Uh, there are a few things you can do. You can kind of like tweak the character concept and the mechanics until they both kind of almost work. I've never seen this work nicely. Like it always feels like the Diet Coke of whatever it is, or worse, the Diet Pepsi. Um, Sometimes you just have to shelve a character idea and be like, well, if we're playing D&D, &D, I guess I, I'm not going to do well with you know, Wolverine. Uh, or even if you're like, oh, we're playing D&D, &D, but I wanted to play like Obi-Wan Kenobi. But you're like, I don't know if I can combine like, the, the elements that I want of Obi-Wan Kenobi with the wizard powers of D&D. Of &D. I'm just going to come off like a low-rent Gandalf. Um, nobody wants to come off as a low-rent Gandalf. Uh, so sometimes you just have to be like, you know what, I'm going to save this character idea for another time. Uh, and honestly, I think that might be the, the simplest solution. Uh, you could also talk to the GM and be like, hey, I want to play a character with this kind of a thing. Is there a way that we can make this work out? And maybe you can. You can be like, hey, I want to play Obi-Wan Kenobi, but in Dungeons and & Dragons. And he's like, OK, so what about like a magical staff that reflects arrows and uh, you know, psionic powers, mm -hmm. telekinesis, something like that? And maybe you can work something out. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can. There will always be other games. So. All right, well, I am unfortunately out of time. Uh, so thank you all very much, and I hope to see you at the next MAGFest. <laughs>